So guys, we're going to get started right away. This uh, workshop today is going to be about uh, power management on STM32 L0 uh, microcontrollers. And um, mm -hmm. I've been working on a, a low power board, um, a sensor board that uses that microcontroller. And um, I've had the chance to look into the latest developments that have been happening on the power management side uh, on the Zephyr uh, platform. And we'll be covering that today. Um, and I'm going to share a link to the presentation in the chat so you can open up the, the link and um, follow along. So has everybody been able to access the document? So to access the document, you need to go to the chat and you have a link there so you can see the whole document. So um, Zephyr has been developing new power management options and um, the new system is going to feature uh, power management of the core itself and individual devices that are connected to the processor. So um, the system itself has had a lot of revisions and uh, the latest code is currently in the main repository and it's still under development. So there's a lot of ideas being shared and a lot of people are contributing to, this, to how this is going to work. And um, the, the power management system uh, is kind of getting, getting put together as we speak, basically. So the new options, uh, when, you, when you want to use the power management system for your project, what you do is you go and uh, enable the power management uh, module in the in the config. So for your board or for your project or um, through menu config, you go and enable power management. That enables the, the basic uh, power management subsystem of Zephyr kernel. Then uh, you can also enable uh, power management for devices. And uh, this is gonna be uh, then, uh, this is going to call spe specific device driver functions, which I'm going to show you later during the presentation here. We're going to go into code. So we have uh, some code examples farther down. Uh, and um, the PM device uh, is specifically targeted at individual device drivers. So let's say you have, for example, a modem or a radio device driver, and you want to implement power management for that particular device. Uh, then this functionality allows you to add a callback for uh, device power management. And when it's time for the system to go to sleep, then uh, this callback is gonna be called and your device driver can then decide what is the most appropriate way to put the device to sleep. Um, then there is another functionality that has been added very recently, which is the regulator uh, function, uh, which is designed for regulators. So when you enable regulator, you get the access to the, to the regulator API, which is, um, described by the functions that start with a regulator underscore. And you can enable uh, and disable regulators, but uh, this functionality is specifically designed for power regulators. So for example, let's say on a PCB, you have, uh, you have a power regulator and this power regulator uh, is connected to multiple devices. So uh, you have the problem that you want to disable that power regulator when, when none of the devices are being used. And uh, because you don't, uh, you can't just control that power regulator directly from the devices. You need this extra functionality, which allows you to reference count how many uh, devices are actually using that power regulator. So, in your device driver power management functionality, you will then uh, call uh, the regulator enable function, which will automatically reference count that particular regulator. And when no devices are using that regulator, it's going to disable that regulator, so that uh, you don't have to worry about um, disabling it from your device driver. Now, if, you're, if your device is using uh, a dedicated regulator or a MOSFET, for example, then there is another uh, much simpler functionality, which is called uh, supply GPIOs, which is basically just a GPIO array uh, that you then use in your device driver uh, to just directly toggle that MOSFET whenever you're using your device. So there is a, there's a few functions. There's a few different ways of controlling power. And we're going to discuss those in more detail uh, today. So hopefully you get a much more detailed overview by the time this presentation is completed. Now, um, the system for the system as a whole, 
there is currently five different power states uh, uh, defined. And uh, these power states um, are kind of taken from Linux. They are inspired by Linux. But uh, Zephyr is kind of taking its own uh, direction when it comes to power management. And the system is going to be specifically uh, written and designed for low power devices. So uh, we want to have very fine grained power management and we want to be able to implement it for uh, all device drivers uh, in a very flexible and um, clean way. So um, the system as a whole has five states. And uh, these states are basically uh, active, or actually it's six states, but it's five power, low power states. So uh, the default state is active, which is when the system is fully powered and uh, everything is running as normal. Now, whenever you, um, whenever you sleep uh, on any semaphore or mutex or, or just uh, put uh, the, all of the threads uh, and the, the application to sleep, uh, you can enter a power saving state. And the kernel will do this automatically because uh, the idle thread will run and it will find that uh, there is uh, the next wake up time is after a certain number of ticks. And based on the number of ticks, it can then pick the power saving mode, which is most appropriate. So uh, this is the default. Uh, you can also implement your own power policy, but the default power policy is currently to, uh, to pick the state, which is um, based on the number of ticks until the next wake up. So uh, let's say you have multiple uh, semaphores and they, they're all, um, they all have different uh, sleep uh, time. So maximum sleep time. So the, the smallest sleep time of all the threads that are currently sleeping is going to be the value that's gonna be used to calculate what power state to enter into. So let's say you are, um, let's see if I actually have an example here somewhere um, specifically for that. Um, so if we go to, if we go to the device tree, for example, when we define our power states, we can set mean residency microseconds. And this value uh, will be used to calculate the, the power state that we're gonna enter into whenever uh, all of the application threads are sleeping. So for example, here, uh, if we were to call uh, K sleep and we, we were to specify 10 seconds sleep time, then it will enter into deep sleep mode based on this particular configuration. If we were to uh, call K sleep with, um, let's say, uh, a much smaller value, if um, if we have a much smaller value for the for the sleep and um, we enter into into sleep mode, then uh, we can, uh, based on this configuration, we would be entering into idle mode. If the sleep value is uh, very very small, then we don't need to enter into any power saving mode because it's, it can be expensive to enter into power saving modes, especially when you have uh, many different drivers using power saving functionality and uh, you have to run all of the device driver uh, callbacks to put all of the devices into power saving mode. So uh, it can be quite expensive and we don't want to uh, put it to sleep every time uh, or put it into power save mode every time uh, all of the threads are sleeping. So uh, the, the mean residency policy uh, takes care of that and uh, allows us to, to pick the idle state or sleep state based on uh, how long time it, it's gonna be until the next wake up. Now, the way they are designed, so the, the idea behind the, the power saving modes is that uh, you should follow uh, basically this uh, description when you're writing your device drivers. So depending on how well uh, you uh, adhere to this to this idea, to this description, that's going to be the implemented power mode. Now, um, all device drivers don't always implement uh, things according to, uh, to the general idea of um, what each mode means. Uh, and it can differ based on, you know, what device it is and based on the implementation uh, of the device driver. So for example, when we talk about standby mode, in this case, in, in the documentation, the, the, the way the documentation is right now, uh, it's actually uh, the same as suspend to idle. So uh, if you look, for example, into documentation for STM32, you will see that standby mode is actually uh, a suspended mode. So it's, uh, it's actually a power off mode uh, when, when you're looking and like reading documentation for STM32. So there's a little bit of confusion between different modes uh, and um, 
when we put STM32 uh, into off state, so when we enter into soft off, we actually put STM32 into standby state, uh, which is the equivalent of uh, a turned off state uh, for, the, for the chip itself. So it's good to be aware that there is a little bit of um, there is a little bit of um, uh, discrepancy sometimes in in the descriptions of uh, different modes, uh, but um, when when you want to when you're basically idling for a short while, you would typically put the system into suspend to idle mode. Uh, when uh, you have a multiprocessor system and uh, you want to save as much power as possible in the CPU, but you you still want to be running, you still want to be uh, basically responding to all interrupts as usual, uh, then you would use the standby mode. Then the system will basically be put into standby mode. When uh, you want to uh, save as much power as possible, but still uh, be able to respond to some interrupts, then uh, the mode would be suspend to RAM. And this saves the state in RAM, but uh, and you're basically powered off, but uh, you are still able to wake up and continue execution of the code. Uh, suspend to disk is similar to suspend to RAM, except that now you're uh, saving everything from RAM onto a disk, and then you power off the RAM. Uh, so this mode would be used on systems where you can do that. Now, sometimes you can't do that, uh, so you won't be using this mode. How do, you, how do you determine which mode is going to be used? Well, you go into your device tree configuration, and you look at this option here, power state, uh, power state name. And this basically corresponds to the mode that the system will be uh, using and calling your callback function uh, with, with that particular mode uh, based on what you define here. So suspend to RAM will be actually corresponding to suspend to RAM definition here. So um, this, is, this is the power management for the chip itself. And uh, the implementation, example implementation is here at the back uh, for STM32L series uh, microcontroller. And uh, it's basically uh, implemented on the SOC level. So you go into the, into the SOC STM32 and then STM32L0. And in there, uh, you would implement the power uh, management for the chip itself. So this uh, power management for the chip itself uses the uh, the STM32 libraries to directly access registers and put the particular chip into, into sleep state. But it's not enough to just put the chip into sleep state. Uh, you also have different devices connected to the chip. So if you even if you put the chip to the sleep state, you can still have devices still powered up and still using up power. So you want to be able to handle uh, power management for individual devices that are connected to your board. And that's why we have uh, the power management for devices as an extra functionality on top of the main uh, power saving functionality. And uh, device power management is implemented through the device driver callback. So uh, if we look at the, we can actually go here and look at, let's see. But in every device driver at the bottom of the file, you have basically the, definition that uh, binds everything to the device tree. And there you have a callback. Uh, let's see here. We can go to the driver. So we can go to we can go to sensor and we can go to this one. So um, in the definition, when you instantiate your uh, devices uh, in Zephyr, you do it using macros. And uh, basically, everything is instantiated uh, statically during compile time, which is very good. Um, so the device tree is actually compiled into uh, preprocessor definitions. So you can use uh, macros like this to extract the data out of the, out of the device tree. And uh, when you instantiate your driver, when you instantiate your instance of the driver, uh, you, uh, let's see here, for example, you have here, um, I use this macro VL53L0X uh, device in it, and then this is passed to DT in, in inst for each status, okay. So this is basically gonna instantiate the driver for every device tree node which has status okay. Uh, you can have a device tree node with status disabled, which means that it's not going to be used, so it's not going to be instantiated, which makes sense. Uh, so you always want to use uh, for each status okay. 
And you always want to use uh, this model where you actually instantiate uh, each driver um, for every device, for every node that you have that uses that particular driver. So you can have multiple sensors that use the same driver, in which case you're going to instantiate multiple instances of that, um, of that device driver or of, of, those, of, of the sensors. So when you call the device uh, DT inst define, you have a specific function here. Uh, the third argument to it is a PM control function. And this is the function that the kernel is going to call whenever uh, the, the system is ready to enter a power saving mode. So uh, it, it has determined that it needs to enter power saving mode. And now it wants to put all the devices into power saving mode. So it's going to call this function. And uh, here's an example implementation of this function. Uh, so PM control. Uh, it accepts a number of arguments, uh, and you can pass uh, context to it as well. So you can have your application context, uh, or in this case, it would be the, the instance of the sensor that uh, this callback is being called for. And uh, when you're entering here, you can check which power mode you're currently entering into. So uh, the, the, let's see, the control uh, CMD is going to be either device state set or device state get. And uh, the argument, the state itself, the context, the state is going to be uh, one of the power modes for the device. So um, the device power modes uh, are very similar to the system power modes, but they're worded a little bit differently. So uh, we have device active state, which is uh, the mode when the device is fully powered on. We have the device low power state, which is basically kind of like uh, deasserting uh, the chip select of a device. So it's powered, it's ready, but it's not, uh, it's not uh, like in fully operational state. So uh, all of the state of the device is uh, still preserved uh, in this low power state. So when you put your device into low power state, you don't just unplug the power uh, of that particular device on the board. Uh, you just um, put it into a state that saves as much power as possible. Then you have the PM device suspend state. And in this state, uh, you basically power off the device uh, completely. So you must uh, save the context of the, of the device itself. So let's say you have a sensor and you have an initialization data that you have uh, written to the sensor. You would uh, normally, when you put it into suspend state, you're going to save that uh, register data somewhere in, in, in inside the RAM memory. And then you're going to restore it when the device is ready to be operational again. So suspend uh, doesn't require to uh, keep the context. And then we have device force suspend state, which is something new that has been added. Um, I haven't really seen that being used. And then we have device off state, which is basically unplugging the power. So when it comes to unplugging power, you can use like a MOSFET on the board that you just uh, toggle. So you turn off the power for the, for the particular chip that, that you're uh, interacting with, or you can have uh, a regulator. Uh, and um, the power management API is going to be very flexible in that sense. It's going to let you uh, both control like very simple uh, ways of um, connecting power uh, or more complex ways when you when you can have multiple devices on the same power rail. And um, you can control also uh, state for individual device from your application. So you can call PM device state set and PM device state get to manually control the power state of the device. So in your application, if you know that, for example, you want to power off a particular device, uh, regardless of what the system is doing, uh, then you can do so using PM device state uh, get and device state set. And these functions accept the generic uh, struct device pointer. So uh, it's all done through, through the API. So you can just query, um, you can query the device tree node using uh, device, uh, device get function. Uh, and uh, then you can basically, um, let's see if we can have a look here. So, and then you can basically interact with this object uh, using, um, from your application using this, uh, this methods, PM uh, device state set and device state get. And, uh, and this allows you to turn off sensors, for example, or uh, turn them on when, when you're going to read them, or maybe sometimes you can keep them off for as long as possible and then only turn them on when you're going to be using them. So that way it's very flexible uh, as well. Uh, then we have also, let's see, then we have also the power management policy. So the default policy is basically uh, the min residency policy. And you can also define this function, uh, PM policy next state. That's the function that's going to be called when it's time to uh, to pick the next policy. 
And uh, if you set config policy app, you can actually define this function inside your application. So you can pick the, the power policy based on uh, the number of ticks you're going to sleep. So the argument here is uh, that's being passed into this function is the number of ticks that you're going to that, that the system is going to sleep next. And so uh, you can return the appropriate state, um, the power state that's uh, that the system needs to enter into next. So that way you have full control over the over the power policy uh, as your application is running. So uh, it adds a little bit of extra flexibility. Um, the power management system is accessed through the device tree using spe special device tree nodes. So you define your power states and uh, you set all the settings uh, in the power state section in the device tree. And then you have to add the power states as CPU power states uh, to the CPU node. For some chips, the CPU label, the CPU zero label isn't defined. So you have to define it. Uh, so if you get an error when you do this, like uh, and the CPU zero, uh, if you get an error, you, you just need to define the label uh, for the default CPU for that partic particular chipset. Um, then we have, uh, let's see, we have the device power management. Uh, we can also use GPIOs for uh, managing the, the power connectivity, in which case we just use uh, the default GPIO functions to query the GPIOs from the uh, from the device tree and then uh, to set and reset GPIO uh, in case that GPI is directly connected to the to the power uh, switch. So on STM32, on the L series chips, we have a number of different power modes. And uh, actually there is like five different modes and they all um, allow you to save power to a certain extent uh, based on um, the, the needs of the application. So some of the power modes are, um, they take a little bit of time to enter and exit. So if you're sleeping for a very short period of time, uh, you probably don't want to enter a deep sleep mode. Um, you would just basically idle for a while, but you still want to save power. So there is flexibility in that. You can, you can just put the chip into uh, low power sleep state, uh, in which case it's running, but it's uh, on the low power regulator and it's very, it consumes very little power. But the, the thing that is interesting um, on STM32 L series is that you can put it into very deep uh, power saving state where the, the, the power consumption of the device uh, as a whole can go down to nano amps. So it can be basically completely powered off, but still respond to interrupts and, uh, and still wake up when some event occurs. So for example, if you have um, some sensor connected to the device and uh, the sensor is capable of detecting something and sending an interrupt to the chip, you can actually power the chip almost completely off and then uh, use the wake up pins to, uh, to restart the CPU when, when there is some work that needs to be done. Uh, but there is a little bit of, um, complexity when it comes to entering those deeper states, because um, when, you have, when you have GPIO pins enabled, you have, to, uh, you have to reconfigure them basically into input analog input mode to save power. Because if you don't do that, you're gonna still end up at like four or five milliamps of power consumption. So you're not gonna go all the way down to, to microamps, uh, nanoamps range uh, if you don't uh, disable GPIOs. But it gets a little bit tricky because uh, you have different uh, parts of your application, or in this case, if you're using Zephyr, it's different uh, device drivers that configure their own GPIO settings. So uh, you need to somehow preserve the state of the GPIOs and then reconfigure all of them and then go back to the uh, previously configured state when you wake up. So we need, a, we need a way to do this. So how do we actually implement this? Um, and if we look at the power policy for uh, the STM32L0, which I have here, under SOC, ARM, and then STM32, and then we go to L0. Oh, it's actually not there. Let's see. Uh, power management. So, so um, in order to enter this very, very low power state, I have to reconfigure the GPIOs. So um, this is still a work in progress. This is not fully completed, but this actually does the job. So 
Uh, when the CPU needs to enter into low power states, I can actually explain all of the low power states. So for, first we have the idle, uh, which is uh, basically just, we just call LPM enable sleep. So uh, when we get, uh, let's say we enter this function here, uh, PM power state set, this is called from the idle thread. So when, when no uh, user code is running, the idle thread runs, and then it uh, determines that we need to set a new power state. So it calls PM power state set. Uh, we get, we end up here. Let's say we want to idle for a very short time. So we just enable sleep and then we go here uh, and we enter CPU idle. Uh, we don't actually need disable IRQ here uh, because I'm actually doing it here. Uh, we do need to disable IRQ before we save GPIO state uh, because otherwise it, it can get um, messed up. Uh, but uh, the important thing here, uh, uh, KCPU idle is actually gonna call disable interrupts. But what it also does is it calls the wait for interrupt instruction. So when the CPU executes the wait for interrupt, uh, when you have set, uh, when you have enabled sleep, uh, the CPU is going to just uh, idle and uh, wait until an interrupt occurs. And uh, when you don't go into deep sleep, when you just go into enable sleep, so there's two different uh, ways of calling. There is another function called enable deep sleep, uh, which is different. If you just go into sleep, then all interrupts will basically uh, wake up the CPU. Uh, so whenever some event occurs, the CPU is going to wake up and it's going to continue where it left off. So it's going to exit uh, CPU idle, and then it will continue in the idle thread, or it will directly switch uh, to, the, uh, to the next thread that needs to run. And um, important thing to remember also is that uh, the interrupts can be, uh, they can be, the delivery of the interrupt can be disabled in the interrupt controller, but uh, the CPU will still wake up. So uh, even though uh, your ISR might not run, uh, the CPU will still wake up as long as the interrupt is enabled in the peripheral. So um, that's basically how the, how the wait for interrupt instruction works uh, on ARM. Uh, so you don't need to, uh, it doesn't actually have to be enabled in the interrupt controller in order for it to exit this um, call to CPU idle and then continue um, on through the idle thread and, uh, and out of this uh, function. So um, the next state here is the, is the standby mode. And in standby mode, we can, we can put the L series into ultra low power mode which uh, disables the internal uh, reference voltage. We can also um, enable fast wake up, which means that it's not gonna wait until uh, the reference voltage has stabilized. So it's gonna wake up faster. Like if you're not using the reference voltage uh, for any ADC conversions right after you wake up, you don't need to, um, you, don't, you can just wake up and continue. You don't need to wait for it to stabilize. There's also a, a function to disable um, to enable the flash sleep uh, power down state, which uh, basically puts the flash memory into power down state. That saves a lot of milliamps as well. And we can also uh, set the regulator, the main regulator mode to low power mode, uh, which um, puts the CPU at very, very low speed and also reduces the voltage as much as possible of the regulator. And we also need to set uh, the clock mode for the uh, wake up. So uh, we can tell the CPU that it needs to restore the clock settings after it wakes up, and then um, we can uh, enter the sleep mode. So this is low power sleep mode. Uh, this basically puts everything into low power and then uh, just does a normal sleep. So the wake up time is very quick and uh, the, the CPU is still basically operational. It responds to all interrupts. Now there's another uh, next step uh, is the deep sleep mode. So when we want to enter deep sleep mode, we use the enable deep sleep instead. And uh, in this mode, um, we want to save as much energy as possible. And also in this mode, we cannot wake up uh, because of just any interrupt. We can only wake up from the trigger interrupts. So it's either the RTC, the real time, uh, the, the wall clock basically, or it is the external trigger uh, events that come through like um, wires connected to the chip. Uh, and in the power down state, uh, in the suspended state, we want to save as much power as possible. So we disable as much as possible. We put the regulator into low power mode and uh, we clear the wake up flag. We set the power mode to stop. So here we just enter enable sleep. So we don't need to do anything. But when we want to enter the stop mode, we need to set the power mode to stop. And then uh, we 
call enable deep sleep. And the CPU is not going to deep sleep directly here. This is just uh, sort of setting up the settings. The CPU will actually go to sleep when we call the wait for interrupt instruction. So when it goes into CPU uh, kCPU idle, uh, in there it's going to call the wait for interrupt, and that's when the CPU will actually enter into deep sleep. So we can continue here, and we can. <clears throat> the next thing uh, we can also do to save even more power is to uh, configure all of the GPIOs into analog inputs, and that basically puts them into high impedance state. And uh, you, you, you're not driving anything. And so uh, you can save as much power as possible. And the way that I've implemented it here is basically that I save the previous state, and then I reconfigure them. And then uh, one of the things to keep in mind is that if you have external triggers, you need to, um, you need to mask those pins so you don't um, mess, mess up the configuration for them. Because if you keep toggling them, you're actually going to be triggering uh, your wake up. Uh, so you don't want to do that. So I, I, I mask out the PA0 pin here, uh, which is a wake up pin so that I don't mess with it. And once the state is saved, now we can go into the deep sleep mode. And when we wake up, uh, when we get out of K CPU idle here, uh, we go back to the idle thread and then uh, the, this function is gonna be called. So PM power state exit uh, post ops. And basically, this is um, just a cleanup uh, function where we, uh, for like normal modes, we just disable ultra low power. Uh, we disable sleep on exit. Sleep on exit is basically that um, does the CPU go to sleep when it exits uh, an interrupt handler? Uh, so we just clean up. Uh, and uh, also for the suspend to RAM, we restore a state of the GPIOs. And now we are ready to operate again. And then we can reconfigure the clocks uh, to run at uh, normal speed of the CPU. And then we unlock interrupts. So when we enter into this uh, function here, the interrupts are disabled. So we need to explicitly uh, do IRQ unlock here in this power management uh, function. If you forget to do this, you'll get weird behavior. Um, and that's basically, that's basically it for um, the STM32L um, power saving modes. Uh, there is a little bit of code I've added here. Um, I've noticed that I originally thought that it would help me debug it better, but uh, I actually opted opted into like um, doing uh, a reset uh, and just uh, doing a reset at the same time when I program the CPU, uh, because debugging is not available when you're in deep sleep. Uh, so you have to just reset the CPU and then uh, you can still program the, the chip uh, as usual. So um, let's see. And also I have references here. So this is really good content. Uh, if you want to learn more about uh, different power modes, uh, you can check out these uh, references here. They're very, very good. So Steve has raised hand. I'm going to unmute you, Steve. Yeah, so hello, Martin, you heard me? Hello, Steve. Welcome. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. So nice to meet you anyway. Yeah. And thank yeah, you nice for for this uh, workshop. Yeah. So I have a first question for you. So uh, for the power uh, saving mm -hmm. on the so on any ARM Cortex, uh, you know, there is a clock. You can activate or disactivate a clock for a specific peripheral. Yeah. Yes. So it's not enough to disactivate only the clock for the peripheral. So in this case, so we must change the configuration for the for the pin in a way you, you demonstrated before too. So to go completely down to micro ampere for, for hour. Yeah, exactly. So um, it's not enough to just disable the clock because you can still have the GPIOs uh, driving uh, the outputs, right? So. Uh, mm -hmm. the output values are still present. If, if you disable the clock, you're saving a little bit of power. But uh, okay. if you want to completely, uh, what, what you want to do is basically completely disable any, any driving functionality or any input as well. So if there is any, um, is, if there is any resistor driving into the pin, you're going to be disabling that as well when you put the pin into analog input mode. So it's going to be completely okay. high impedance. And that's what you want. You basically just put a wall there. So there is nothing uh, that can go in or out of, of the pin. 
And so that reduces okay. the power a lot. Um, and that's that puts the chip into equivalent of um, very, very similar to this uh, lowest power mode, which is standby mode. Um, but um, yeah, like normally standby mode basically doesn't consume any power, but you're still gonna see that there is power consumption because there's other stuff on your board that consumes power. Um, mm -hmm. It gets re really hard to, to measure it precisely, like how much it mm. actually consumes. But uh, you can get really low if you, if you go into deep sleep and you um, set all the GPIs to, uh, to analog inputs. Okay. Thanks. Is that a project you're working on um, where that's applicable? Yes, I am working on uh, a device for a battery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it does use CAN. And uh, actually, we have a requirement to send only four times, let's say four hertz data on the CAN bus for each battery. So the idea, of course, then is to, to go completely to put the, the device on sleep mode completely and wake up only when there is a need to send some uh, message on the network, yeah. Yeah. So, so there is also, uh, if you go into the deepest mode, so the way that the okay. deepest mode works, I haven't, I haven't really mentioned that, but it actually reboots the CPU. So, okay. um, so the first one that I mentioned where I disabled GPIOs, that doesn't reboot the CPU. That can re still resume the execution uh, and mm -hmm. continue. But then there is this complete uh, power off mode where uh, you, put, you put the CPU into deep sleep, uh, but now it's uh, in standby mode. Okay. And the difference is basically that you call, um, let's see here if I find the code. The difference is that you call uh, sleep uh, here. So you set the set power mode to uh, power mode standby. So you can see here I set power mode stop, but here I set it to standby. So uh, this mode will actually never wake up uh, where it left. It will wake. It will just reset the CPU, and uh, you can then restart the chip. So that's useful if you are waking up very very infrequently, like let's say once uh, every few days. Uh, and check something, okay. uh, then you can use this mode to completely power off everything. And that goes down to really low power consumption. That's almost basically the cheapest, uh, almost off. It, it's just responding to triggers. Perfect, thank you. Yes. <clears throat> okay, I put the question on the, in the chat. Uh... But I can uh, read it, or it better if you can read it yeah. yourself. Yeah, I understand. I understand what you mean. Uh, so the idea is basically to disconnect the pin uh, from any driving circuitry. So if you put the pin into input or output mode, then it's connected to to the circuitry that is either the input circuitry or the output circuitry. Uh, uh -huh. When you put it into analog mode, it's either connected to analog input. So analog pins are basically connected to equivalent of a uh, op-amp input. And uh, it's basically infinite impedance. So it's, it's very high resistance. There is, uh, there is no current flowing into the pin. Uh, so if there, is, if there is no analog input, like basically the pin would be disconnected. But if there is an analog input, then it's going to be connected to this high impedance uh, input. And so there's not going to be any current flow going through okay, it. Okay, I understand fully that. But uh, I wasn't sure because I've tried to move this in, into analog input mode to be as alternate function for some specific function, but I have, as far as I can see, this, there is no option for many of the pins to be in this alternate fun function analog input. And that part is the confusing for me because I saw in the code that you are putting uh, like uh, general to be analog input mode, but like many pins of the specific micro, simply it's stated in the data sheet and the software support from SC that it can be I2C, it can be I like timers or something else, but this uh, analog mode is not listed for, for that specific pin. And that part is confusing me from the, I can see here, it looks like that each uh, pin can be put into this analog mode. That's a little bit unclear, but okay, thank you. 
Yeah, I, I understand. I understand what you mean. So um, uh, I have to check exactly how it's how it's done, like on the chip. Like I, I need to check the circuitry on the chip. But um, my best guess in this case is that so this this thing basically works like a multiplexer, right? So you can you can set it to analog um, analog function. You can set it to input. You can set it to output. You can set it to alternative function. So if it's an if you want to use it for I2C, you would set it to alternative function, uh, and then it will go to the I2C. Now to save power, you don't want to connect it to any of those, like not alternative function, not input, not output, uh, but you want to con connect it to the to the place where uh, you have no current flow. And uh, for the pins that have the analog function, it's the analog function basically that is the the highest resistance, highest input resistance um, functionality available okay. on the pin. Thank you. Uh, but I don't know exactly how it works for pins that don't have that functionality. But um, I use um, the way that I do it here is that I use the LL libraries. Um, so it could be that the LL library explicitly would check that, but I would need to check the source code. Uh, and also I would need to check the data sheet for the chip uh, to see exactly like what happens if you set a pin into analog mode that doesn't have analog mode. But I would guess it would just, uh, it would just be disconnected basically. But I agree that would be that would be worth uh, checking out. So, um, Steve, did you did you have another question? So now, so the next question is regarding the development environment. Yeah. So um, I want to give you so the the picture. So the issue we are facing for now. Yeah. So basically. Okay. We are using uh, Texas Instrument microcontroller, NXP, ST32 uh, family uh, microcontroller, and Nordex semiconductor microcontroller too. Uh, and at the moment, for commercial use with uh, Nordex, so NRF 52, 53, and 91, uh, there is already support for Zepha. So if we can generate the, the, the project already for Zepha, and then we can use embedded Sega Studio. So it's a professional, you know that, yeah, mm -hmm. to, to, to debug and develop the, the software. And my question now is, uh, which, out, which advice you can give to me, so on which direction to go and which development environment you think can be, can be, can, can be something we can invest time to set up so we can use to generate Zepha project for different uh, family product we want to use for the microcontroller. So like a Texas Entrance, NXP, ST32, and so on. OK. I would suggest basically use whatever whatever feels good for you, because it doesn't matter with Vapor, right? Because everything is written uh, in CMake um, at the, like, at the comp compilation level. Um, mm -hmm. So um, what environment you use is up to you, basically. Like, what do you feel, uh, what do you feel most comfortable coding in? Because you're going to be using the environment to code. But then you're going to be using the Zephyr um, build commands to build the, the project. And okay. so it doesn't really matter like at the end of the day, because uh, you're not actually uh, using the environment for, you're going to be using it for debugging. I mean, that could be very useful uh, when you have mm -hmm. specific functionality and the more advanced functionality for tracing and uh, things like that. Um, yeah. but, but that is sort of, um, th that is kind of like, that's not related to the actual build command. You would just configure the, the Zephyr build command so that you build with West or with CMake. Uh, mm -hmm. And that would basically build your whole project. And the configuration for that is all text files. So you're basically changing text files and changing options. And sometimes you run menu config, but um, most of the time you just um, set the options directly in the text files. Um, and from that, you generate your build. And uh, example between because I make some investigation and there is a C Leon that you can uh, uh, add a plugin for for to support uh, Zephyr and then or to go directly with Eclipse and then we set up everything from the from the beginning. So you think something set up with Eclipse should be enough, yeah? So we can uh, open source, so we don't need to pay any licenses and so on, yeah. Correct. Um, I mean, I don't even use um, I don't even use like built-in build functionality to build the project. I just use the command line. So I just run make, and then uh, I use the the default scripts. 
So uh, okay. in terms of support, uh, all you need is to configure the build command. So you would just use uh, like a custom build command and you can do that in most ID IDEs, like mm -hmm. you can use Visual Studio Code, you can use Eclipse, you can use um, even code blocks or whatever you want, right? So um, you just configure your custom build command and um, uh, that would connect it directly to this, um, to the little icon where you can click build. And um, when it comes to debugging, um, exactly, that is the most important topic. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to debugging, uh, the way that it works um, is that you like there is there is built-in scripts in Zephyr that start the debugging server. So you can, you okay. can like West debug, and it will mm -hmm. automatically start GDB and try to connect to the to the target. Uh, okay. When, when I'm running, for example, STM32, what I would do is just um, uh, start the ST utility for um, uh, for the ST link, which will okay. automatically mm -hmm. start the debugging server, and then you can connect to the target. Then you can use your debugging tools uh, as usual, like exactly okay. Like okay. On, on on the PC when you're debugging a running executable. So just like okay. connecting to a running executable, you would connect to a debugging server, which is running like on a port locally. Uh, so you connect to like port 333 and that exactly. connects to the target through the debug debug link and then you can okay so uh so that's sort of how it works and if you have built-in support for uh, for debugging tools like if you're using an id from a manufacturer um then you can just directly connect to the to the debugger so let's say you're using mm -hmm. ST tools you would just connect directly through the through the st uh, you can use like uh, uh, tools that come directly from st and that uh, already supports the ST debuggers. Uh, so the debug information is already in the executable. Uh, so everything is in, in there, right? So when you compile the executable with debug information, you have like all the source code, you have all the line numbers. So all you need is just to have the executable, the ELF file, and mm -hmm. the target that's actually running the, the executable. And uh, with those two, you can debug the application. So you don't actually okay. need the source code. So th that's that's what I mean. So, so you don't you don't actually need to Set up the link between the source code and the uh, like and the debugging tools, um, like the hardware debugging tools, because that's two different steps. So first you build the source code, you produce the ELF file, then the ELF file contains all the debugging information, and you can just um, uh, connect to the target and you can then debug. Now, of course, it's it's easier if you can just you know if you can set uh, directly breakpoints uh, in the IDE. Um, but then, you know, then you can just use the ID that comes from the manufacturer of the uh, of the chipset uh, that already has all those features. So you can start up literally that ID when you want to debug, and uh, when you want to write your code, you just use whatever ID you want, so whatever like feels most natural to you. That's how I would do it. Like if there is anything specific uh, when it comes to debugging options. Okay. Most of the time, you could just use, uh, you know, you could just use normal tools because they all support GDB and uh, like for, for most things, it's enough to just run GDB and uh, step the application, you know, set breakpoints, uh, maybe break on some interrupt or maybe trace something. So for most things, you don't need like mo the more advanced stuff. Uh, you get into more advanced stuff when you need to trace uh, very short periods of time. Like if you want to trace. Uh, yeah, because you know, that is, uh, that is okay because um, we, are, we, are, we are implementing Profinet and uh, Ethercat uh, uh, protocol too, yeah? So sometimes we are going down on, um, on cycle of uh, 120 microsecond, you know? Okay. So then the idea was, okay, which developer environment can give us all the, the tool we need to trace down to a specific real time uh, uh, performance to see how the, the system is behave correctly, you know? Mm -hmm. So that is my fear. So I said, okay, then uh, the idea, okay, so you have one only like few tool where you can say, okay, you can uh, use few tool to develop based on which manufacturer of the MCO SOC you want to use. And, you know, you use the same and then you continue. Yeah, code again, again, again. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, like the, the good thing about ARM, uh, ARM CPUs is that they they have a lot of debugging functionality. So, for example, exactly yes. Uh, so, for example, you have this uh, debugging uh, UART uh, that uh, that is in the in the debug unit on the on the chip. SVO. Yeah. 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 Exactly the the SVO. Mm -hmm. And yeah. mm -hmm. you can write to that thing uh, from interrupts, uh, and it has a, uh, it actually has a queue uh, in it. So like, exactly, you can write yeah. Times. 
and that that's helpful. Uh, like that that okay. provides a little bit of tracing functionality. Um, but beyond that, like I would I would look for specific tools uh, from manufacturer that, uh, that provides like for specific chips that that you want to work with. Okay. Yeah. And um, there is any link you know that you can uh, provide so I can uh, start to have a look to some some to to get started, you know, to 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 look at it. We can get some uh, information. How can I set up to do some demonstration to see if we can uh, evaluate it? So give me an example. Some, uh, like what 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 would you want to trace? So except for now, most important is we want to have a possibility to trace down to see example the uh, uh, the in percentage the utilization of different tasks in this case so if you're going to we're going to switch from free atos to zephyr mm -hmm. i would like to see the performance for each task how many memory they are using and what is the context switch to yeah so uh, so and not only, of course, so we can, uh, okay, in case of uh, SYO, we can uh, put some uh, information on the UR, that's okay, should be fine. But something that we say, okay, we are not losing completely the debugging option we are getting from FreeRTOS if you combine with different uh, tool from uh, Sega example, yeah? So there is mm -hmm. some specific trace uh, uh, tool, you know? So they are free to use, yeah? So. Yeah. To have this functionality still there, but at the same time we have this, uh, let's say, leverage of the Zephyr. So we can scale it down or scale it up based on which type of project we want to uh, we want to develop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for that, uh, when it comes to like uh, profiling threads, there is functionality mm -hmm. for that specifically, uh, which is accessible through the console. So uh, you can enable uh, the counters, and it will it will count how many cycles each thread executes. So you can see uh, what is running and what is not running. So you can you can run like uh, the console command. So when you enable the shell, you need to enable the shell mm -hmm. in the configuration. Uh, that gives you console commands, and one of the commands is kernel, and then kernel threads uh, will show you the the threads with. Um, uh, with counters, I think for counters okay. you also need to enable. There is a special option for uh, mm -hmm. for tracing uh, the execution time, um, but it's it's related. I guess you could search for like um, thread. It's thread something. I don't remember exactly what it is, uh, but okay. there is an option for that which gives you exact uh, cycles uh, per thread. Okay. So that's for that. When it comes to tracing interrupts, um, like. The easiest way to do that is just to have a few pins, which you can just toggle, uh, and uh, you can see timings between certain events in, in the application. But if you want to use okay. um, like tracing tools, uh, then it doesn't really matter which system you're using. You're still going to be basically tracing the application. Um, OK. But just to, like, just to keep things simple, like sometimes, sometimes we overthink. You know, Sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. for example, we, we might think that we need a tracing tool to trace how many microseconds uh, some of our threads are executing, but we don't actually need that, right? So if there is if there is functionality for that that already measures that, um, then we don't we don't need to use tracing tools for that. We can just use the shell command, right? So that's what I'm trying to get at. Uh, so sometimes there is simpler ways to 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 accomplish the same thing um, uh -huh. that that remove the original issue, right? So. Then you don't need to worry about switching to Zephyr, for example, because you can still use the same way of debugging that you've used before. That sounds good. I mean, uh, one of the things that I use a lot myself is that uh, you know, if there is if there is a LED on the board that you can mm -hmm. toggle on and off. Um, okay, with oscilloscope, then you can measure. Yeah, exactly. The... Like if if you have something yeah. that's really really short, like if there is yeah. a yeah. microsecond <laughs> delay, you just send it mm -hmm. to the lab and then you can just uh, use a scope to, to figure out like how long something takes. Okay, okay, okay. And that's usually enough. Uh, and, and like for complex things like protocols and uh, uh, like if you're using Ethercat, uh, complex things, you would, you would usually test them like off target. So you would test the protocol, make sure that it works, that it doesn't hang in the protocol stack, that it kind of does what it's supposed to do. And then when you put it on the chip, it, it just runs. So. Mm -hmm. 
And then uh, another question is regarding the licenses, because, uh, you know, uh, I read about an article now. So basically, uh, they want to certify the ZEFA. So with uh, the long term release, mm -hmm. yeah, so long term support. Yeah. So and uh, so any information or something you can tell about this certification. So which level of certification actually they are trying to 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 achieve? Uh, I don't know much about that. Um... OK, OK. Okay. I, I do know that they, they want they want to have official certification like for safety and security because there there is like exactly. there, there is te tests that they run on the code mm -hmm. that ensure mm -hmm. certain uh, aspects of security. Um, but um, beyond that, like I'm not really sure about that uh, side of things. Um, so I'm not, probably not the right person to ask. Um, but are you like, are you worried about the licensing of the code or are you worried about meeting some certifications that? No, I am worried more about the safety functionality. Oh, so in case of EEC uh, 61508 or for medical devices, yeah. So oh. in case, so I say, okay, so we can take uh, the, because you see like in case of FreeRTOS, if we use FreeRTOS, then we need to go through a specific process of certification. If we use a free RTOS certified, so safe RTOS, so we need to pay for the licenses, but of course it's certified already. But in case, for what I understand, like if Zepha get out with a certification already, press certify, basically, uh, component, then uh, should be a good starting point for us to, to leverage the certification and just develop and certify you part of the component we are developing. So not the whole product, but just a small part of the uh, the, 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 the firmware, yeah? Mm -hmm. So. Okay, yeah. Um, have you tried asking um, somebody like out of like Linux Foundation or somebody who is more closer to that safety yeah. part? Yes, um, now I registered to the community for the ZEFA. <laughs> so now I get in touch with someone and I want to get a little bit deeper to understand exactly this process. So with level of certification they want to achieve. So to understand too, so maybe to plan maybe for next year and so on. Yeah, okay. right. I will see, yeah. So, um, so can, maybe I, you I know something it. already, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I can let you know if if I can find somebody who is responsible for that, um, mm -hmm. but I, I would I would strongly suggest that you talk to somebody who is actually like involved with certification every single day. Yeah. Who's okay. Responsible mm -hmm. for that part of, of the system, because I'm guessing that there is a lot of um, regulations that you have to comply with if if it's a medical. Exactly. System. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Um, on the other hand, Zephyr is probably your best choice. Like, I don't know of any other choice that uh, is such like open source. At that, at that level of quality too, right? So exactly, yeah. You, know, you have yeah. free artists, but it's a little bit smaller. Like, it's it's a, it it has its own. Um, it, it kind of fills its own space. Free artists, right? So Zephyr aims to be something much bigger, like almost like Linux, but for embedded devices, and yet uh, still. Um, aim to certify um, against all of these certifications and safety criteria, uh, which mm -hmm. is, I think it's pretty cool um, that, it, that it's um, at that level and yet also aims to, to be certified. So I think Zephyr yeah, is right. the best choice. Like there is no other system that, um, yes. that comes mm -hmm. close to that, right? But now the question exactly. is how, right. close right. are, yeah. how close is Zephyr to that goal, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, I saw that you have expertise too on Canvas. Yeah, so yeah. I saw that on Zephyr there is a specific module for Canvas for Can uh, Flexix data too. So uh, both, uh, uh, if I leverage Zephyr and we make a configuration to have a Can module inside, then actually we don't need any more any Can open stack to. So implement a device based on CAN uh, protocol. So there is no any more need for that exactly. Yeah? Um, those are two different things though. Uh, so CAN open is a higher level protocol that runs on the, the basic CAN messaging. So um, yeah. are you looking to implement something that connects to a CAN open network? Yes, exactly, yes. 
but non something is it need to be something very custom can network so you cannot connect any other device that stock can uh, can protocol yeah the idea is only this type of device going to talk use going to leverage can network to to broadcast basically data okay and so the question we are facing now is okay we need actually we need can open something stack like this or not or we can just leverage the the simple uh, module and just send and receive can message and do a filtering mm -hmm. with a socket so that should be enough exactly yeah so it kind of depends like what type of network you're connecting to um if if you have let's say so close uh, network is a close network yeah um so when, when you when do you want to use a can open um, uh, device? Let me explain that first of all. So okay. can open is a network which is uh, based around the idea that you can configure the network uh, at runtime. Mm -hmm. So you have your can open mm -hmm. master and you configure nodes to communicate with each other, uh, and that is very useful. So for example, if you have uh, let's say a sensor that mm -hmm. senses, uh, something that is used by a motor, and uh, you connect those two devices to the network, and then you have your can mm -hmm. open master that uh, sends messages to both of them uh, during the startup time and configures that, OK, this sensor has to send uh, the value to this uh, motor controller. And it's going to do this every uh, millisecond, let's say. OK. Mm -hmm. and after that, the only thing that the master does is basically sends the clock, the message uh, that, that ticks the, the bus. So uh, OK, the trigger, sell, let's say. Uh, trigger, basically, yeah. And, and then it sends the trigger and then devices communicate uh, and exchange messages. So it's mainly very automatic. So that's very useful. And when you have like uh, different sensors, different motor controllers, it becomes extremely useful to, to do it that way. Because now you can program those devices to communicate with any other device. So you, you can build out your network. That's what can open is useful for. So if, if okay. you have a custom network where you like just want to send messages, then it's enough with just Canvas. But if you want to have okay. this extra functionality, like this extra layer where you can actually build a dynamic network out of off-the-shelf mm -hmm. components. So the, the key part here is off-the-shelf components. So if you want to use off-the-shelf components, then CanOpen is really, really good. Okay, perfect. Okay, I get it. I get this different because that's just a, that's a, thank you. That was a very interesting point. Yeah. So, and there is no need in this case for can open to go through some certification at all exactly yeah so it's uh, it's not required it's not mandatory yeah um, if it's a custom can network let's say yeah i mean the only case where i would uh, imagine it would be mandatory is if if it's actually required to support uh, the the protocol itself so okay okay because okay. it's on a higher level right so it's, it's exactly like, on, on the, it's not like first there is the electrical level, then there is the CAN mm -hmm. layer, which is the message, mm -hmm. and then there is CAN open, which is the higher level messaging. So, for from certification standpoint, uh, it sounds to me like if it's a requirement that you want to that you need to comply with, then it would entail that uh, the network that you're going to be connecting to is going to be a CAN open network, then it would be a requirement. Okay, okay. But it's not okay, from okay, the safety, okay. it's more from a functional perspective that, it's, that it would be a requirement. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, Steve, you actually have a question from uh, Sartak. Uh, he asks you, which TI IC are you using? Does it have? Yes, for Texas Instrument, we are using uh, the module is a CC. Uh, three two zero, so is uh, with a wireless integrated uh, radio, and then plus uh, with a version A, so CC two three zero something. So that's the Bluetooth version, uh, five point one uh, specification compliant. So those are the two um, uh, microcontroller from Texas Instrument. Uh, we are using, and then of course uh, we are supporting uh, Citara family, of course. Yeah, so the the range of Citara family microcontroller. Yeah. yeah. Very good questions. I'm glad you uh, you asked, Steve. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, was a uh, was a great workshop.
Yeah. Great cool. to have you here. So uh, does anybody else have any questions? If not, then um, thanks everyone for being here and um, have a great evening. Yes, uh, Martin, just a question. Uh, can you share the link to get the uh, pre your presentation uh, about this uh, step? Yeah, exactly, yeah. It's possible yeah. to get it. Here. I posted it in the chat. So if you open the chat, uh, you can- Okay, let me, okay, I missed the chat. So, perfect, I get it, yeah. So, there you go. perfect, perfect. Thank you, sir, it was really clear. Awesome. All right, everyone, until next time. And um, thank you very much. Have a great time. Thank you, Martin, and uh, good evening to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Martin. Ciao. All the best. Yeah. Until next time. Ciao, ciao.